So hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, July 19th, 2013. Today we're going to talk about balloonatics, uh, a new moon for Neptune, uh, the fact that an astronaut almost drowned, uh, recreating the pale blue dot, gold, gold from stars, a uh, terrible heat wave, new images of Comet Ison, and uh, water trapped on red doors. Joining me this week, a ragtag crew of space journalists. We've got Sonny Springman at the Arecibo Observatory. Hello. We've got Amy, we've got Amy Shear Title from Vintage Space. Hello. We've got David Dickinson, hey. a.k.a. the Astro Guys. Uh, we got Jason Major. How's it going? And uh, last but not least, we've got uh, Dr. Matthew Francis. Greetings. All right. So uh, let's get cracking first. Now, Sandy can only stick around for about uh, another 20 minutes, so we're going to start with the story that she wanted to talk about, which is balloonatics. And I will be honest, I had no idea what she was talking about. I spent the first five minutes or so just trying to digest this new information. So, Sandy, so please this explain it to me again, and now use small words. Only small words. Yes. Well, I'm a small person, so that's okay. Um, so we're going to be, later in this hangout, you all are going to be talking about Comet Ison, which is going to be making a nice pass through the uh, inner solar system later this year on Thanksgiving, actually. It's going to make its closest pass to Earth. But, and we're going to be pointing every spacecraft we possibly can lay our hands on at it. Messenger is going to be looking at it. Hubble's been taking beautiful images of it. Uh, and there's a bunch of other, I think even Soho, anything that can point at the sun is going to be looking at this thing. But also there's some risk. As this thing comes in through the inner solar system, it might break apart if there's a coronal mass ejection, if there's a large solar storm, this thing could lose its tail. It could become a total dud for reasons we don't even understand. So a number of scientists at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins University are actually designing a balloon to carry a suite of instruments up into the upper atmosphere, not quite the space, for 22 hours. And they're only going to get 10 hours of science out of this. But this is kind of nuts. So I'm calling them balloonatics for that reason. And I really hope this term sticks. Well, nope, there's a lot nope, of, nope, of really Rangers. interesting uh, balloon balloon science. Have you seen the Blast documentary? I love the Blast yeah. documentary. And I one mean, of that... my friends is actually working on Blast Pole, which is a successor. It's well, really I mean, neat. if anyone hasn't seen it, it's not only is it sort of great if you love space, but it's actually like one of the best done documentaries I think I've ever seen. It's and it's a balloon and, and, Ar and Antarctica. Yeah, yeah totally hard sweet. times 12. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a lot of science that gets done with, with balloons like this, you know, the high altitude and, weather balloons. So this isn't... And the reason we do this at high altitude is because we have all this water in our atmosphere. And that's really great, but it blocks a lot of very interesting stuff that you would see in the ultraviolet. And we also have this really nice ozone layer. So the more you can get above our atmosphere, you can see stuff that our atmosphere would otherwise block. So that's why we try to have telescopes in space. We have telescopes on planes. And we also have telescopes on balloons. So this telescope's only going to be about 30 inches across. It's not even going to be a meter. But they're going to get a lot of stuff out of it. And they're not just going to look at this comet, but they're also going to look at a couple of asteroids and other objects that have interesting UV characteristics. So it's kind of nuts that it's only going to be less than a year from the time that they decided that this comet was actually discovered in 2012, I think, and when they decide they're going to launch this thing in the fall. So that's that's bold, as Gentry Lee would say. Bold. It's bold. Good. So, yeah, this is going to enable us to get some really sweet photos of what, Comet Ison, aside from the new ones. What I've always wondered, being a backyard astronomer, it's tough enough to point my own telescope. How do they point a telescope on a balloon? <laughs> That's. <laughs> I think they're probably using star trackers. I think they're probably using oh, okay. a lot of the technology that they would use on spacecraft. That's just my guess. But yeah. to reorient the balloon when it's up there to keep it pointed in the rough, the right general direction, then have the telescope itself actually be able to, to point. That's crazy. And then what happens That's... when the balloon pops? Well, it doesn't pop so much as they let it back down and then they, they oh, chop okay. off the payload and they expect to recover it, but it might be a few days. So you have to design for that. So because again, if you ever see those people who, who launch those weather balloons and they always, uh, you know, they go up really high altitude and then I know, like with those weather balloons, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger until they pop. Yeah. And then they, I don't, 
the goal the goal is not to get this thing to pop because that would be <laughs> bad. I mean, you can sort of design your pay payload for litho breaking, as they say, uh, litho like the lithosphere and breaking like arrow breaking. Except you expect it to crash, so you don't really want things to crash. There's a video going around right now on YouTube of them putting this thing together, and it's kind of delicate. I just wouldn't want that to crash into the ground. So this is kind of bold and audacious, and I hope they're successful, and I hope they get some really sweet images of this thing and get some great science. Uh, now, we got a request from YouTube. Uh, somebody wants you to show us the dish. I can't show you the dish from here. Oh, you well, might be able to back. see the telescope. There, you can see the telescope. Oh, yeah. There we go. Coming out uh, of the woods. It's become almost tradition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, Hugo Burnham says, I didn't know you sailed Fraser Kane, but actually I think it's your uh, uh, icon. It's so my I'm, icon with the yeah. sailboat. Yeah, That's I actually do have a sailboat, thing. though, so I do actually sail. Can I come visit you? Anytime, anytime. Yes. Um, okay, what is next? Uh, so let's talk about the new moon for Neptune. Amy, your title. Yeah, Neptune has a new moon. Well, not really, because it's had that moon for a while, technically, probably. Um, but it's new to us, so that's kind of neat. Um, so it was uh, Mark Showalter at the SETI Institute who was looking at pictures of Neptune taken by Hubble between 2004 and 2009, and he found a little dot. So he tracked this dot in 150 images and was able to actually figure out that it's a moon figure out that it's orbit and confirm that it's a moon. So now we have this moon that I think is called something like S2004-N1 right now. Um, it's probably going to be named for a sea nymph before long because all of uh, Neptune's moons are named for some kind of sea goddess or sea nymph because the Astronomical Society or the IAU has to do a... You know, everything has to have a, a theme. Um, but it's kind of a neat discovery, not just because it's a new moon, but because it's, I think it's kind of a neat reminder that we don't actually know very much about, oops, sorry, phone, um, that we don't actually know very much about Neptune. I mean, we only found Neptune in 1846. Um, and then its its main moon, Triton, was found within, within 17 days, I think. Sorry. <laughs> um... And then, and then the moons came pretty slowly thereafter. Um, I forget when the second moon was discovered. I think it was Nuried, I think, back in the 1940s. I can't remember the exact year. Do you want yeah, to just huck your right. phone out that door <laughs> in that closet behind it's, you? It's, Airplane it's, my, it's my mom. She keeps calling back when I hang up on her. <laughs> um, I think you're right. Yeah, it was in the, the mid-40s the mid yeah. that someone found yeah. it. And then it wasn't until Voyager 2 got to Neptune in 1989 that we discovered six more moons. And all of a sudden, this system is huge, and Neptune has all this crazy weather going on, and it's clouds, and um, it has And rings. the ring arcs, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that they, yeah. That people thought that, or astronomers rather, thought that it was sort of half ring arcs. And it turns out that they're very fine rings, but they're complete rings. And then in 2005, we found five more moons and more Hubble data. So these this keeps coming. And I think it's kind of interesting that we don't, we don't think about how little we know about Neptune, but there's a lot to know about Neptune, and, and, and Triton this, itself is pretty awesome. Well, a lot so. of this stuff comes in waves, right? You get the situation where you've got, like, um, I know with the, uh, like with the New Horizons, right? It's going to be showing up at Pluto, and it's going to, you're going to have a new instrument that's really close, and it's going to be able to, I'm sure, if we've already found, what are we up to, five? 12, five, however many five, five for Pluto. Yeah, you know, th there's going to be more probably when you get that instrument. You get the stuff in waves. We, you know, discovered a bunch with uh, with Voyager. So this is going to be. I think. I think we talked about this last week. We need another ice giant mission. We do. Yes. I really, yeah, I would love to see something that goes, and I don't know anything about orbital trajectories, but something you should go from Uranus to Neptune <laughs> and study the moons on the way, because, yeah, th that'd be awesome. When I was a kid, oh, yeah. Neptune only had two known moons. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was I was actually thinking about posting on Twitter, like, you know, how many moons do you think Neptune has? Because I think in my mind it's five. I'm trying to remember, like, when I yeah. learned how many moons it had. When, it when had I was five. in grade school, it was two. It was two, yeah. yeah. So not till Voyager 2 went by in the late 80s did it start, the numbers When I was a kid, on. Pluto was a man. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That kind of dates me. <laughs> That's Isn't awesome. that true for all of us, though? Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on. Uh, and let's talk about this actually quite uh, scary spacewalk that just happened this week. 
Yeah, there was a routine spacewalk uh, Tuesday morning. This was uh, the, the second of two routine spacewalks. So they had done one the week before. Uh, this was uh, Luca Parmitano and Chris Cassidy. Uh, Luca Par Parmitano is an ESA astronaut, and Chris Cassidy is a NASA astronaut. And I usually I'm watching these spacewalks kind of over on one monitor while I'm writing, and I'm kind of intermittently like turning it on and muting yeah. it as they're doing it. And then in the first hour or so when I turned it on, I noticed they were starting, uh, Luca Parmitano was starting to have uh, reports of water in his helmet. And uh, they cut that spacewalk short. It was supposed to be a six to seven hour spacewalk. They finished a few initial tasks, but uh, ended up only being an hour and 32 minutes. They got him back inside, and it was a little tense there. It wasn't as bad as it, it sounded once they got him back in, but there was points where they couldn't actually communicate with him. They were they were telling him over the comm that it's like if you could, if you can hear what I'm saying, squeeze my hand. And he wasn't actually communicating out of the helmet. He said later it was kind of like being you know like a goldfish trapped in a bowl. So water was coming in there. So it's uh, it was a little bit of a scary situation. He mentioned that the water it didn't taste like the water. And that, that they use for drinking water, it, it tasted more, it had kind of a funny taste to it. So, but there, when I watched a little bit of the NASA press conference afterwards, as of, unless they just found out recently, they're not sure what the leak was exactly, but he's okay. Uh, there's never been a space, an astronaut lost on a spacewalk. You remember uh, uh, Commander Hetfield had a, a moment where he was getting tears in his eyes, he mentioned at one time, and you can't, like wipe your eyes or anything when you're in a suit. So his, uh, if you lose your vision, you have a big problem out there as well. There's a lot of things in a spacewalk that can turn a routine spacewalk into a hazard very quickly. Water yeah. just kind of sticks to the surface of things and yeah. and that does funny stuff, huh? And I, I wrote a while back too about micrometeoroid impacts. I didn't realize this till I read it in the uh, quarterly Space Debris News that NASA puts out that they have problems with spallation, a little micrometeoroid impact craters on the handles and the rails that they have to grab that uh, become sharp and can actually cut the, hand, the, the gloves of their spacesuits as they're walking. They've identified and filmed these little areas where there's little micrometeoroid uh, uh, impact areas. That, that's another problem that they have to watch out for on spacewalks is these handles over time. It's, the International Space Station has been out there a decade now. It's getting pitted from these little micrometeoroid impacts that could easily pose a, a, a razor sharp hazard to their gloves as well. I'm picturing that scene in, um, if, if you haven't seen it yet, Europa Report. No, so, I haven't. No. Uh, um, I haven't actually, seen that either. Yeah, it's actually very cool, uh, uh, very, very cool sci fi. Film that has a lot more psi than phi. Wow. Um, you know, until about you know, is, until you get to the end and stuff. But yeah. there is that that whole idea of a spacewalk gone bad because of a you know yeah. a, a rip in the a rip in the. Is there a Sandra Bullock? Yeah, Sandra yeah. Bullock I just saw the uh, the preview for that. I was at yeah. Pacific Rim, which rocked. Um, oh, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, and they had uh, they had a preview for that movie. What's it called? Ale Elysium. No, yeah, not yeah. Elysium. Yeah. No, an Andrew Bullock. Spacewalk one Spacewalk out movie. Yeah. Someone in the chat, please help yeah. us out. Um, sunshine, Skyfall, no. Uh, <laughs> something like really Stranded. Bad. Something very descriptive. Yeah, yeah it looked. Yeah. But Graphic. I looked from what I could see from the, uh, well, fr from the preview, it actually looked pretty realistic. Kind of terrifying, actually. Is so. it Gravity? Was it Gravity? Gravity. That sounds right. Oh. Oh yeah, Gravity. That's the one where the the trailer blew up the International Space Station. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that it? Yeah. Yeah, that was terrifying. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. coming out this fall. And especially terrifying. just, you know, as as she's like sort of floating off into space and can't quite reach the last part and just, you know, like this that's it. There's nothing you can do. No way to get back. I haven't heard a time that they're going to they're going to redo this spacewalk at at what point they're going to uh, I haven't heard if they're going to reschedule this one or or not. They're probably going to find out what the problem was first. Yeah. But yeah, I mean it's it's become so routine. I mean, it's funny. We we don't even report on on Universe Today anymore, you know, like when there's a spacewalk. Like, unless something, you know, it, we report on this one, but if there's nothing really that big, we won't, it, we won't really even report it on it. It made all the major networks in a hurry once there yeah. was a problem with it. It was on the Yahoo front page within maybe 20 minutes, so once there, there started to be a problem, so... Uh, okay, so uh, it's time for our selfie. Well, not exactly. Uh, it's time shortly today for a picture. You're going to leave, Sandy? 
Well, I'm going to wave at wave Saturn, it? too. You're going to wave at Saturn. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you're going to leave. Um, right. So, uh, Cassini, today is the day that Cassini is going to be recreating the pale blue dot uh, and take a picture of Earth. And uh, Messenger is getting in on the action as well. They're going to take a picture of Earth, too, from that perspective. So, uh, Jason, what's the math here? What's the how? How's this going to work? Well, Cassini is uh, obviously around Saturn, and in, in, uh, it's going to be pointing at Saturn in such a way that the uh, Saturn is between it and the Sun. So uh, Saturn will be in eclipse, and Cassini is going to take a whole series of images. I think you know there's going to be uh, uh, at least thirty different frames across, so you know, a bunch of images across, down over another row, and eventually those will be put together in a, in a big mosaic that will be beautiful and gorgeous and amazing like everything else Cassini does. Um, but in that shot, way off in the distance, uh, actually just down and I believe to the right of Saturn, there will be a little speck, a little, a little, blue, a little blue dot, and that will be us, because you know, looking back towards the sun, we're in that scene. Um, so this is this is something that that uh, we knew was going to happen. That was announced to the public over a month ago. So in effect, this is the first time that the population of the world is being told beforehand that they're going to have their photo taken from nearly 900 million miles away. Um, so you know that's the whole idea behind the uh, wave at Saturn. Um, you know the the, the, the uh, movement behind that. So it's like you know at at this point in time, you look up in the sky, smile and wave. Um, in fact, uh, uh, director of imaging Carolyn Porco, she uh, she has a uh, another side site called um, the day the Earth smiled. So that's you know the idea is like everybody uh, just you know give a smile out to Saturn, out to Cassini because your picture is going to be taken. Um, so it's kind of one for the history books. Uh, Carolyn Porco has done a great job of yeah. sort of organizing this. Uh, you know, if you if you ever sort of see her or kind of have talked to her, she's a very serious woman, and uh, and I think she's done a really great job of kind of coordinating and, and reaching out to the public and getting people involved in the Cassini mission. I mean, well, she was she was involved in the the last time that that obviously the last time Cassini took a picture or a series a mosaic like this, which was back in um, I believe it was September 2006, and she was involved in the uh, Voyager uh, was it Voyager one. Uh, original pale blue dot imaging that was uh, in 1992, I, I want to say, and that was taken from beyond the orbit of Pluto. So you know, uh, as Voyager um, was heading out, so you know, she's th this is kind of her thing. You know? I know um, she's done just a yeah. textbook job of mm -hmm. being a really cutting edge scientist, mm -hmm. and and really sort of helping bring that data in, and then also making sure that that data gets out to the people as quickly as possible so that they can work on it and then thinks up really clever ideas to sort of help whenever you can sort of synchronize the science. I think, you know, a lot of other people that are involved on missions could really take a, a lot of messages, a lot of, you know, read from her playbook because she's done sure a thing. fantastic, terrific job. Sure thing. So so the, the images that are coming, that are, uh, Cassini will be taking, it, it's today at 5.27 p.m. Eastern Time. So, you know, what, wherever you happen to be, um, there's, you know, you can convert from there. Um, I don't have the, I don't have the universal time, but anyway, it's 527. Well, so it's, it's 3.27 right now, right? In your, uh, 325. Yes. So, so in two hours. Exactly two hours from now. From right now. Mm-hmm. So um, th that's when Cassini will start taking the photos. Now, that time, 527, is adjusting for light travel. So in reality... It takes um, it takes about 80 minutes for photons to travel from Earth to Saturn for Cassini to take the picture of it. So Cassini won't actually be taking photos when that you know that wave at Saturn time is. It'll, it'll be later. But in order for you know for it to be captured at the same thing, you know you got to account for that time span. Um, so that's where the 527 comes in. So when you wave up at the sky, and it, don't worry if you, if you're actually facing Saturn or not. The whole planet is really going to be about a pixel in size, so you know you got to use your imagination in the final one. Um, but anyway, when you're waving out there, it's that those waving photons will be traveling, and Cassini will be ready to pick them up uh, when it does start to take its photos. And, Occupy um, the pixel. Occupy <laughs> the pixel. Yep. Now, what about Messenger though? Like... Messenger, as it turns out, is uh, uh, in orbit around Mercury. 
is doing the same thing. It actually took a series of photos aimed our way this morning, and it's going to take some more photos uh, tomorrow morning. Now, what Messenger is looking for, it's not making this grand sweeping mosaic of uh, Mercury and Eclipse or anything like that. Messenger is looking for any moons around Mercury. Um, we've all been taught that Mercury has no moons, like you know, Venus has no moons, but you know, kind of like Neptune, there could be moons around there that we just haven't found yet, because um, it's kind of a difficult spot to to you know find anything just because of its proximity to the sun and, and all this other stuff. So um, Messenger, uh, having been orbiting Mercury since 2011, is uh, has occasionally looked out you know around the area around Mercury to see if there's any moons out there. So as it does this, uh, it actually did three series of photos this morning, uh, and it'll do three series of photos tomorrow morning. Earth will be captured in those photos as well. So um, we're kind of having, you know, we're photo bombing these space exploration missions on both sides of the solar system, I guess you could say. Um, so it's kind of interesting, you know, we're going we're gonna to see all of these perspectives uh, on our planet. That's Again, awesome. in, in, in Messenger's images where, you know, the entire Earth-Moon system will be no more than a pixel in size, but it's still kind of exciting to, you know, get, a, get a, such a perspective on our planet from within our own solar system. I love those. I love those pictures. I mean, when they take like the the rovers and they take pictures of Earth from Mars, that just that's so cool. It's this whole "you are here" concept, you know, and yeah. and and what we look like from you know really not that far away. I mean, it's still within our own solar system, and we're just that little pale blue dot. Uh, now, Matthew, you had a story that you had proposed, and I realized that I didn't put on the on the list. And so I'm just going to let you talk now. Okay. Um, this is actually a bit of perspective on uh, the history of our own solar system, a snapshot of a solar system to be a uh, another star that is about 80% the mass of our sun, so a little smaller. But the star system is, is similar enough to Earth, uh, to the solar system, um, but it isn't, there yet it's it's a what's called a protoplanetary disk um, I, while I'm talking I will bring up the image um, but it's it's a uh, is this at the carbon monoxide snow line one yes okay all right uh, so, okay so here's here's the image this is this is a a uh, sub millimeter light image of this system taken with the Alma telescope array in Chile and uh, the Blue circle you can see in this picture is actually the orb is the same size as the orbit of Neptune, and the green is light emitted from the location of frozen carbon monoxide, which freezes at a lot colder temperature than than water does. Um, but here's the thing: is within that circle in our solar system, you have all the pl the big planets. You've got the terrestrial planets, you've got the, the gas giant planets, you've got Uranus and Neptune. Outside that, you've only got little bitty stuff. You know, the biggest thing out there is, is you know, Eris, Pluto, that kind of stuff. The rest of it's little chunks of, of you know, rock and ice, comets, that kind of stuff. So that's an important division in our solar system, and we're seeing that division in this distant star system. And here's the other cool thing about it, literally cool thing, but carbon monoxide is a catalyst for chemical reactions that lead to prebiotic molecules. Well, prebiotic, as you can probably guess, the name um, means it has to do with biology. Uh, comets are chock full of stuff like amino acids and other molecules that are not the building blocks of life, but kind of the building blocks of the building blocks of life. And so there's, there's a lot of hints that these molecules were brought to Earth and the inner solar system by comets at some point in the solar system's history. And so we are seeing where this car carbon monoxide frost line is. Inside, the, inside that ring, uh, carbon monoxide is gaseous. Outside of it, it is, it is solid. And so it's just a very interesting thing. We're seeing kind of a snapshot of what our solar system would have looked like when the sun was about 10 million years old, um, which in star terms is pretty young. You know, 
Earth, humans, we think of 10 million years as being a long time, but it's actually not uh, not that. The solar s star systems form pretty rapidly in cosmic terms. So this is a snapshot of that point in history, and it's really, really interesting. What kind of star is that, Matthew? It's well, it's it is a it's uh, it is still it, it's um, called a. Tari star, so it's technically uh, not, it has not entered what's called the main sequence, which is the phase that our sun is in. So it's sort of a pre-star, um, but it's, it's uh, uh, you know, again, it's, it's the, the it, it's going to be fairly sun-like when it, when it's actually uh, has ignited and become uh, a, a, a normal-ish star. Um, and I was, you know, here in in our solar system, right? You got the situation with our snow line, but it's the water snow line, right? So you've got, you know, Vesta and you've got Dawn, and, you know, right. on opposite sides of this of the snow line. We've already looked at Vesta, which is on the inside of the snow line. Right. And it's it's a you know rocky world, craters. But next comes Ceres for for Dawn, and and it's going to be it's going to have ice and snow and look like a moon of you know, of Saturn a bit. Of Jupiter, yeah. Yeah, so and I think so, that's the, it's the same situation, right? But but instead of it being water, it's carbon monoxide, and so just different. Right. Yeah. And actually, that's another good point. Of course, in in our solar system, you've got you know, on the on the near side of the ice snow line, the water snow line, you've got the terrestrial worlds, the rocky worlds, and on the far side, you've got Jupiter. Okay. Well, obviously, there's something really big and important that happened on that but of course if you look at you know if, if you look at at how much of a difference that is um, that's a lot closer to the star okay it's a lot harder to find the snow line for water so um, that's you know th this took all the power of of Alma to to find this carbon monoxide snow line so we're gonna have to have higher resolution still to see where the water snow line is um, so I guess that's sort of the next step you know can we see that can we pinpoint it and that would be a really cool thing too uh, so we got a question here and I actually wanted to fire this off to Amy um, so this relates to Lucas spacewalk does anybody know what the procedure is for problematic suits is the suit returned to earth in a layer Soyuz resupply mission or replaced or inspected or fixed do you know how they have dealt with this kind of thing historically no nope okay <laughs> actually that's a really bad answer um, no the the sort of the most troubling spacewalk that comes to mind um, historically is Gene Cernan's spacewalk on Gemini 9 when he they hadn't really figured out to put handles on the capsule yet so they were just like groping around on this smooth thing and he worked up such a sweat I think he I think there was like two liters of fluid in each boot just from sweat but they didn't it was a short mission they didn't even take the suit off he just came back to earth and he got onto the carrier deck and like dumped out water from his boot. Um, I know I know. historically the procedure, just since we were talking about the movie Gravity, um, if an astronaut were to spin off into space, procedure called for the commander to come back alone or the remaining crew to come back alone. There were no provisions to rescue a stranded crew member. Wow. A little fun fact. There's, um, I think it's in Deke Slayton's autobiography where he talks about bringing commanders of missions into his office and saying, okay, so we're going to go do a spacewalk, and if anything happens, you shut the hatch and you come home alone. And they all had to do it. Thankfully, think, nobody did, but that was procedure. I think Alexei Leonov on his first spacewalk nearly had some overheating problems, he said. Yeah. Um, he also had the problem that his suit expanded when he got yeah. out into the vacuum, and then he couldn't fit into the airlock, so he had to bleed the oxygen out of his suit to deflate it, but not wow. so much that he would die. So he's very, you know, cautiously <laughs> bleeding out air. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That amazes me, because those guys, they had no idea what they were doing. I mean, they had some idea nope. what they were doing, but it, they were totally trailblazing doing that. Yeah. Uh, Hugo Burnham notes, uh, uh, I believe there were about 50 daughters of, of Nereus and Doris in Greek mythology, the Cenips, so plenty of scope for Neptune's newly discovered moon. And awesome. I guess if we, send the, if we do send that ice mission, that ice probe mission there, um, what are we, how did we describe it last night? Probing Uranus? Well, probing Neptune. Um, that, uh, yeah. That, that's, the, just, that, that, that's just a cheap one. For the I know, I know. They would yeah. probably, they would probably, it's they would probably find a lot. We had that conversation last week yeah, for yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I just I can't help myself. I gotta keep bringing it up. Okay. Well, you know what? I want to see Jason and Matthew fight, possibly to the death. <laughs> so, uh, what we're going to talk about is a very controversial story about gold, gold from colliding st stars uh, that Jason worked on. Uh, so, what I want to do is, Jason, why don't you just present the story, and we'll watch Matthew just rage about the sort of the science, and then we'll let him uh, him respond. I'll mute my microphone, and you'll just see my mouth <laughs> flapping over here. Just yeah. see the gr the grumbling the grumbling sounds. Um, all right. Well, I'll frame it this way. Um, researchers from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in Cambridge were observing or, or looking f actually looking further into a uh, gamma ray burst. A, um, uh, it was a short uh, it was a, a short term gamma ray burst uh, located nearly four uh, billion light years away, and it was just you know basically like a quick flash um, that left a glow. And when they when they did some research into uh, the the source of this glow around it, it was it was kind of an anomalous glow. Um, they find that the 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 cause of this gamma ray burst was likely to neutron stars uh, that may have been part of a binary pair and you know smashed together. Now, of course, neutron stars are the uh, uh, remnants of you know sun-like stars, uh, a little bit bigger than the sun, maybe from you know from like. I think the numbers is uh, is uh, one point four to nine solar masses, so you know slightly larger than our sun. Um, they've eight times eight, eight yeah. times more massive. It's eight. Okay. Yeah, it's a lot bigger. So so you've got all this this mass of the sun smashed down um, into basically the, the the remnant core. So I mean I think you know they they like to say things like a teaspoonful weighs you know a, a billion quadrillion tons, so something ridiculous like that. Anyway, these two things smash together. Um, and they produce heavy elements. Um, the, this, that's what the glow is supposedly come from. It's a radioactive glow that was seen in the near infrared by Hubble. Um, and, and part of that stuff that's left over is heavy elements, and part of those heavy elements are supposedly gold. So to, to add up how many of these types of explosions um, or collisions or whatever have happened throughout the history of the universe, they say, all right, well, all the gold on Earth probably must have, maybe must have, come from these types of collisions. Um, so then, the, you know, they kind of make that next jump and they say, all right, um, when you look at your gold jewelry, you're looking at the, you know, pieces of, or, or, or uh, atoms that were created in colliding uh, neutron stars. So, and they even gave a number, I, I believe, during a, a press conference at the CFA, saying about 10 times the mass of the moon from this collision was, um, was gold. So, you know, that's, that's an awful lot of, of gold if you really think about it. Um, of course, you know, that's scattered across the, uh, you know, across the galaxy or across the universe. So, you know, little bits and pieces, and that's what eventually comes and lands on a planet, uh, sinks into the core, some ends up on the crust, and you end up getting things like, you know, gold teeth and gold jewelry and gold stuff inside of all of your components. So, but this is the part that makes Matthew angry because... All right. First of all, I, I want to correct what I said earlier. You were right, Jason. You were saying the mass of the neutron star, and I was saying the mass of the progenitor star. So, okay. um, yeah, I realized I realized as soon as I said it that I said the wrong thing. Um, but uh, here's the thing: is I, if you looked at what they said in the press conference and looked at what they actually said in the paper, there's no mention of gold in the paper or of particular elements produced. And when when that happens, that that says to me that they figured they probably couldn't get that bit past peer reviewers for for publication. Um, that that's that's the kind of thing that triggers the whole. Okay, the reason they didn't put it in the paper is because they're not sure, and they don't have actually strong enough evidence for it. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the problem: is what you're seeing is this red glow at the same location as the gamma ray burst. It's probably associated with the same event. I see no reason to doubt that. It's probably what's called a kilonova, which is a hypothetical thing. Nobody's ever seen one before, but it'd be pretty cool if it was. And that's and an awesome name. It is. I, well, I kind of, I kind of roll my eyes out a little bit. But uh, stop. It's awesome. Okay, kilonova. All right, we we will grant kilonova is awesome for for the sake of of this conversation. But uh, the thing, the thing that is 
you, you have to follow a chain of reasoning. You have to say, okay, first of all, this, this red glow is consistent with being a kilonova. If it's a kilonova, then what's making it glow is nuclear fusion, or nuclear, I should say nuclear reactions, not necessarily fusion the way we usually think of. Neutrons rapidly colliding with atoms and making heavier atoms. And if that's the case, then you could be producing elements like gold. Okay, and then you got to do a calculation um, to show, and I don't know how they did this calculation to show how, how much gold would be produced. And so basically, because none of that was in the actual paper, I don't know how they did the calculation. You don't know how they did that calculation. Um, and so that's why I, I got a little grumpy about the press conference was all gold, 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 because the paper itself was very interesting. And I'd like to really, you know, I, I, I think it would be wonderful if we could verify if this is a kilonova, if we could verify that others of these, these uh, neutron star collisions do this kind of thing. Because if some heavy elements, including gold, come from this kind of, of collision, gamma ray bursts like this are really bright. You know, they're some of the brightest things in the universe. We can see them at cosmological distances. Well, considering that this was visible from 4 billion light years away. And, and that's a close they, one. And they refer to it as a close one. Yeah, that's so. a close gamma ray burst. I mean, we talk about ones that are like 10 billion light years away. You know, that, that was, I think that was one of the most, I can't remember now which of the most distant one was, but you know, there was one that was briefly visible with the unaided eye. But I guess the question is, does this mean that all gold comes from Neutron star yeah, collisions. That was my not question. My or paper, does it yeah. mean, you know, like, what about... Some super, could. We have been taught that it's supernovae, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what Carl Sagan always taught us. Yeah. <laughs> was Carl Sagan wrong? I, I would not have to change... I would have to change my entire star party spiel that I always tell people when I say, my wedding ring came from a supernova. But but, well, but, that's, you know, but that's exactly it, right? Is, yeah. is if, if kilonovas are responsible for some... You know, for gold, they may not be responsible for all the gold atoms. And how would you get, you know, I mean, don't, don't, aren't neutron stars incredibly dense? The gravity field, you know, is going to be, it's going to hold on to that gold. So how would you get from Kilanova to, you know, Earth to seeding, okay. you know, the solar nebula? And, that, and that's, that's actually another good, another good point. Thank um, you. Supernova, <laughs> yes, that, you, you, Fraser, you, you, you put your finger right on it. Supernovas, uh, you know, core collapse supernovas, the kind that, you know, we think of as being, you know, we're star stuff, you know, get Carl, get Carl Sagan to say billion for you. Um, but uh, those are located where stars are dense. That's where stars are young, they're forming. When supernovas go, they trigger more star formation. Where these short duration gamma ray bursts are located is where old stars are. They're 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 out in the middle of of nowhere, galaxy galaxy wise. They're out in the you know the the outskirts. That's not where new stars are formed. So even if gold is produced in these explosions, we've still got to get a long way. There's still we still have a couple missing steps to get that gold from that location to into a new star forming region. And then yeah. the idea is, you know, do, do they do they like a core collapse supernova? Do they do they scatter these, right. these elements, you know, uh, uh, out uh, like they would have to, you know, or we are they like, nebula. right? Or are they or are they like a, you know, are they like the 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 Tolkien dragons of the universe <laughs> yes. and they hoard their gold? You know? Ooh, I like that. Nice. I like yeah. that. Oh, yeah. he just brought you down with a appropriate, uh, you know. Story that just <laughs> fed into your left, left, yeah, left yeah. Tolkien love. It's, it's, oh, it's, devastating it's, attack, Jason. I gotta say. All right, well, uh, let's move attack. on. We're agreeing. We're agreeing. We're agreeing. We're agreeing. We, we, we agreeing. We, you know what? Wanted us to. I, I think, but I think. Okay, so here's the takeaway from this, which is that when you see a ridiculous claim by a press officer in a press release and a news conference, you know 
that the scientists themselves are gritting their teeth during that press conference because of the ridiculous things that, <laughs> that they're being asked well, to say. Well, those were that the claims were said by the lead authors. So but even so, the, I, I know what's happening ahead of time. The press officer is saying, "Okay, so so I've looked through your paper. I've I've tried to understand what you're telling me, and you're saying gold. Gold comes from okay. That's it. That's what we're running with. We're going with gold. And you know, let's just focus on the gold and not about the Kilanova, even though that would be an awesome name, uh, or any of that." stuff. So I think that's, you know, a lot of that stuff, uh, whose phone's ringing now? Mine. Um, <laughs> a lot of that stuff comes from, uh, you know, that you try to make the news spread as they far as headline. possible. You want, a headline you want the big headline. headline. And, you know, and you're going to dig and you're going to sort of twist it and tweak it and stretch it as best you can to get that to have the widest play. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and we as the space journalists are the recipients of that and need to come at it with our skepticism and say, okay, you're telling us this, but that's a pretty big claim. What do you have to back it up? And, and I think, you know, you can often tell the people who, who do this for a living because that's like your first line of defense. I don't know about, about you folks, but I, whenever I see that stuff, I'm like, okay, wait, what? And then I'll dig into it and try to try to put that in perspective. But a lot of times you see some of the more mainstream news and they just run it. They just reprint it. They just, you know, whatever just got if, said, you know, if it came from NASA, then it's good enough for me. If, if Hubble could find a solid gold moon around Neptune, that would roll. There we go. Um, so I'll then see. we'd get funding for that Neptune mission. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. there we go. We're gonna we bring that gold moon home. Come on, it's right now, right now. Well, With there's the PR school. there's way more gold in all of those uh, asteroids out there already than in platinum and iridium and all that kinds of stuff. And as we now know, it all came from colliding neutron stars. All right, let's move on. Um, so uh, you guys on the east coast are having a horrible heat wave, and oh, there's a really great. It's it's damn hot. It's hot. And, and there is a great picture uh, that you posted. I'm going to try and dig it up while you talk about it, Jason. So what's so what's going on here? Well, I mean, starting. Um, it, I mean, it's been you know, it's summertime. Yes, we know that. Um, but this past uh, this past week has just been uh, a real you know a real sticky, humid, muggy, wet, hot mess over here on the eastern side of the U.S. Um, and even up into Canada. Um, I mean, you know, the heat indexes, as, as people, you know, like to talk about how, what it actually feels like, um, it has gone up into the, you know, the 105, 110 today. Um, and so it's just been, you know, it's just been a mess. There's, in fact, a, I just looked at it last night. There's just a huge swath of heat advisories running from Minnesota all the way over to New Jersey, eastern Pennsylvania, um, you know, Boston, New, uh, Rhode Island, where I am. It's just, you know, it, it's just a mess. So, uh, one of the NASA satellites, I believe it was the uh, the GOES East satellites, uh, actually captured what is you know you can see you can see this heat wave from space. Now you know what is a what does a heat wave look like from space? In this particular image, it looks like a big old empty spot sitting uh, right over the Ohio River Valley. And pretty much all of Ohio is is a, a big clear area. So it made it pretty obvious. Um, and I guess what that is is a um, Let's see. There's a term there. Uh, it's a closed. It's a mm, upper level ridge, and it was over the Ohio Valley uh, on Monday, and a closed upper level low uh, that was over uh, on the western side of Texas um, and heading towards New Mexico. So it kind of trapped all this air in there, um, brought in a lot of moisture, and just sat there and got gross and sticky. And um, is, is pretty much what we're sitting under now. Now it's supposed to break. Uh, to, not to get into too much of a weather report, but it's supposed to break um, tomorrow when a uh, colder front moves in. But um, you know, up to up to then, it's it's just been kind of a unpleasant mess over here. So you're not gesturing you know. enough. You yeah. Need to be like, uh, <laughs> moving in from yeah, the, moving yeah. in. <laughs> need the blue I mean, screen. Wait, wait, there you go. Where are you all uh, located? Right, like I'm on the west coast on Van you know in Canada, and it's mm -hmm. been you know normally this is our kind of awful time of the year. August mm -hmm. gets a little worse, but but so far it's been great. Been, well, th that you know, that's yeah, nice, that's, but not awful. That system that's running um, running across the western part of the country is actually, you know, giving giving lower than average temperatures down in the southwest and keeping it pretty uh, pretty comfortable up in the northwest. So, you know, it's the eastern half that's been sitting underneath all this gross stuff. Um, I'm in I'm in Providence uh, in Rhode Island, so I mean, it's just it's just kind of a you know a gross situation over here. Um, 
it's just you know it that summer. But it's uh, it, 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 what was interesting it was that that was captured in a uh, satellite image from space. So to see what a heat wave looks like. And Amy, you're you know you are from Canada, and then moved to Arizona, and now you're on the East Coast. And 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 how do you now that you've experienced three different kinds of weather? Nothing like it's not 119 degrees, so I'm fine. Like it's it's just not nearly as bad as Arizona, and my body is still so tuned to Arizona. Apparently, I didn't know this till I moved there that like your blood actually changes to properly cool yourself when you're dealing with 120 degree temperatures for most of the year. So I'm still I get freezing really easily right now, but this heat is not really bothering me that much. Really, that's awesome. Yeah, it's no, weird. No, I, I, I spent I spent eight years in Dallas, and typically. You know, the, when I was there, the most of the summers were just, you know, I mean, it was month after month of over 100 degree temperatures. Is it is it really humid? Not so much, but it's still really hot. So when they say, oh, you know, it's the it's not the humidity or it's not the heat, it's the humidity. You know what? Uh, the, the the humidity really does, you know, make a difference. You come east oh, yeah. coast and 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 uh, it, it it's sweltering. Uh, yeah, Arizona's summer when it's that hot is way better than Toronto summer when it's like that hot and you have pollution and it's just sticky and it's just like it's like you get out of the subway and there's just a wall of air. At least in Arizona there's just hot air. Mm. It's air. <laughs> like a pizza uh, oven. I can't even imagine. It's like a hair dryer on you all the time. <laughs> oh. That's that's what Arizona feels like. Uh, um, okay, so we're gonna move on and we're gonna just gonna show a really cool picture of uh, of Comet Ison from Hubble. And then we we actually showed this last week, but uh, yeah, Ison's on the other side of the sun. Yeah, what's the update on Ison, David? So Ison's can... on the other side of the sun, and I think the new cycle will pick up in late August when it comes back around, and we get some more looks at it. And it's the the big question mark is going to be how it brightens up uh, when it heads in toward perihelion at the end of November, and what it does from that point from late August until late November. It's going to be the really big question mark. And as we've been saying every week. It is, it is either going to be the most spectacular comet in modern human history or, uh, and you can't see my crazy hand gestures, or mm. uh, a complete non-show. It'll be another Kohotek from the yeah. 1970s. Yeah, so you, yeah, you got those Or it'll be somewhere in between. From. Somewhere between if, if, if there's, an there's an option that it could be a good binocular telescope comet uh, like Pan-STARRS was earlier this year, but not the greatest visually either. So I think it's going to probably be the best after perihelion if it survives. It'll be like Lovejoy a couple of years ago where it'll unfurl this nice tail that you'll see in the morning sky. So, but, but I mean, you know, with Hubble observations, have we got any updates, any any idea? We just, we really won't know until it goes past Hubble's orbiting Earth, so unfortunately it's got, Hubble's got that same blind spot yeah. uh, that it's looking at right now too, so Hubble can't really get a look at it. I don't know if any of the stereo satellites might pick it up. I know sometimes, I know that we were mentioning earlier about SOHO, as uh, Sandy was saying SOHO, is going to observe it. It's going to pass through the Lasco C3 camera in November, so we'll be able to see it track through Soho. But that's all. So when will we know to like freak out, change our plans, <laughs> schedule, you know, telescope time? I I think I think talking to comet expert John Bordel, I wrote a post on Universe Today a few weeks ago. I think I kind of concur where he was saying that I think it's going to underperform as it comes in then we're going to get this new cycle that Ison is a dud, Ison is a dud. Then if it survives that perihelion passage, then it might pick up where we're actually seeing something and we have a bright uh, naked eye comet that we're seeing on the other side. So. And so give me a date. Uh, I would say right the weeks before Christmas would probably be the best time. If it makes long. If it makes it through perihelion. Uh, it could be like Ellen in a few years ago where it was supposed to be the comet of the century and there were all these conspiracies that Ellen yep. was going to hit the earth and everything and it just broke apart and and did nothing. So. We, well, broke it apart, saved we broke this. it apart with our space lasers. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, wonder, I was waiting for that theory to go around that we launched Bruce Willis out there and he took <laughs> out the comet somehow and NASA did a secret mission out there to, but you know, we, we tried to spread these rumors but it just didn't seem to happen. So. Yeah. Yeah, we deal with this every single time. <laughs> <sighs> okay, um, let's move on. So I've got one last story, and this comes from David. And uh, you're talking about water trapped on red dwarfs. Yeah, the, these are planets around, terrestrial planets around red dwarfs. There's the potential out there. It was a paper that went through uh, astrophysics journals from Professor Kristen Minow at Columbia University. And they ran some studies using a program called Planet Simulator out of the University of Hamburg. 
and they were looking at terrestrial planets that were tidally locked, kind of like our moon that are keeping one hemisphere toward their parent star, and they found that if about a quarter or more of the equivalent of Earth's water with the same insulation on those kind of planets in a, the habitable region, the habitable zone around a red dwarf star was present, that there would be a circulation pattern where it would actually form and pool as ice on the far side of the planet that never saw the red dwarf sun. And as that ice migrated around the front, there would be kind of a hydrological cycle where it would evaporate, circulate back, but you would actually have a little niche there inside the ice, the snow line of that solar system, where perhaps on the back of those terrestrial planets, there would actually be ice and water kind of pooling back there. So it's another interesting place. Uh, there were some commenters on the post that mentioned something. It's like, yeah, I guess that's possible. They said, well, if it kind of tilted like the moon, where we actually get a little bit of libration where the moon is actually rocking back and forth, there might be a small habitable region where there's liquid water in between that transition region where there's ice on one side and then it's, it's a park scorched planet on the other side perpetually facing towards its red dwarf star. Uh, can I ask a question? This is how far away are these? Because there's there's some concern yeah. about the winds from the the that's, stars sweeping away the atmosphere. That's that's one problem that he cited in the paper as far as because the habitable zone is in like I believe it's like about a tenth of an AU where it starts. And one problem life would have, of course, is red dwarf stars are very tempestuous as far as the amount of radiation and the storms they release there. Uh, that would be a big problem for life. And he, and he did mention uh, when I interviewed him that he said if the atmosphere was pretty appreciable, you probably wouldn't get that kind of hydrological uh, cycle there too. So. so that's well within the orbit of Mercury. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's where it begins. Yeah. I'd have to look it up. But the red dwarf habitable zone is much closer, but it's broader than ours too. It's uh, right. about like a tenth of an AU out to, I think, like a, an eighth of an AU, something like that. I'd have to look at it again, but it's a uh, it's a lot wider than the habitable zone in our solar system is. Uh, okay, well, I think we're run out of all the stories that I had put up. Unless somebody has anything else to talk about, I have one thing that I'd like to talk about, which is the Perseid meteor shower is going to be happening as always uh, about three weeks from now, August eleventh. Um, and I have put an event on Google+, Plus, which is go enjoy the Perseid meteor shower. And so if you go search on event, search for Perseid meteor shower on Google+, Plus, you should find this event. Just click yes on the event, and then you will get a reminder in your email, in your calendar, when it's time to go outside and enjoy the Perseid meteor shower. That is the beginning and the end of, of what this event will be. And, and you know, it's going to be a nice moon this year. Yes. I no say. moon. Yeah favorable year. So it's going to be a really great year for the Perseids and it's summertime for the northern hemisphere and you know you get like 60 meters an hour and it's just terrific and so what I really recommend that you do is is there's a I put a link to the dark sky finder and you can f go to your area and it's great because it shows you this map of all of the dark sky in your area and try and find a place that's yellow or darker and go there and like you know, plan it out and like organize a bunch of friends and all go together and take some hammocks and some chairs and like lay back. Binoculars, bug spray. Bug spray, <laughs> depending on where you live. It's you know, we don't have a lot of bugs here, so we're pretty good. Um, uh, and 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 make a time of it and you know, prepare for the kids to to conk out, but. You know, the longer you can hold out, the better it gets. You know, one in the morning, two in the morning, when it's really dark, it's just terrific. So, so you know, if you need something to do this summer, plan your whole summer around enjoying the Perseid Meteor Shower with your friends. Now, we're going to have all kinds of material. I'm sure David is already gearing up his brain on the stuff he's going to write about it. But, uh, but yeah, but and we'll get more information as you go. But just, you know, commit. I'm just saying right now, commit. To, to enjoying the Perseid meteor shower. So and and all the folks here in the hangout, are you all going to see the meteor shower this year? Yeah. Oh yeah, Amen. I'll be watching. Amy, I watch every. Possibly. Possibly. Depends. I'll be in Toronto, which is you know not the best place to look at the sky from. They'll they'll so. they'll have the meteors there too. Yes. You can even see enough. it from the city. Just <laughs> go to a park. All right. Go to park. All right. Um, cool. Okay. And so now let's. Uh, so for everyone, where can we find out more about the things that you do? Amy, share title. 
Um, you can find me in all sorts of fun space history. Um, my blog, Vintage Space. Um, I also write for Discovery News. I do videos for Scientific American, Al Jazeera English, um, Device, and Motherboard. And I will just throw out there that tomorrow is the 44th anniversary of Apollo 11. So come find me, and I'll be Yay. putting up tons of weird pictures of astronauts. <laughs> and you've and you've got an an upgoer five model behind you there. I do, yeah. I can kind of. Here we go. There's my. It's a two foot tall Saturn Ooh, V. Cool. It's not not lovely, but you know, I built it myself. I know. Yeah. Um. <laughs> at some point, you you should bring one new model each time and hold it up and show us what you built. Sure. Well, you can't see the ones on the shelf behind me, but I have my little lunar module. Now, have there. you seen that Emily Lockdewalla knits them? You're, do you I know think so. Now that you're yeah. mentioning that, yeah. I think. I think I remember seeing knit yeah, that, landers. That, that might be the next level. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, uh, David Dickinson. Let's see. This week I've been active on my own site, Astro Guys, Listasaur, Canada.com, uh, Universe Today, of course. I've got a post coming out this weekend. Another anniversary is the Great Meteor Procession of 1860. i got a little history post going up on that. And I just Sorry, Is that the one that went across Canada? It, it did. It went across uh, northeastern U.S. and Canada, but there was a bunch yeah. of researchers that sleuthed it out a few years ago. There's a big article in Sky and Telescope. I wrote I, about it around that time too. Yeah, I uh, talked to the to the guy, one of the sleuths, and he was yeah. talking about it. And they actually saw that procession around the world. They thought. So, no. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and so and so the thought is is that maybe it was something orbital, like 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 a moon, you know, maybe a moon, it, something. So there's some really interesting story. Yeah, no, I didn't I, know that facet of it. No, it yeah, might have been like yeah. like the one we had last year over UK. They thought that skipped through the atmosphere and then came back again. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, 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 will, I will give you the name of the person afterwards, but yeah, it's a it's a really. I think interesting it's the story. same one. Sounds yeah, like the same one. Probably the same guy. Yeah. 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 Um, he's the one who also uh, debunked the star positions for the Titanic. Yeah, I think it's Don Olson. It might have yeah. been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the guy. Yeah. Okay. So, and if we want to uh, read the other stories that you do, and I also have a science fiction poem. I sold another one coming out to Starline Magazine, in, I think it's going to be in the October issue. Haven't sold any stories yet. Still working on that. So, any publishers out there, I'm available. <laughs> Uh, you, you mean science fiction stories? Science fiction stories. Right, that's okay. my. That's one of my other hats I wear. Right. As a, okay. As a wannabe science fiction writer. Uh, Jason Major. I'm at lightsinthedark.com. I write at Universe Today, Discovery News Space, and you can find me on Twitter uh, at JP Major. Oh, and um, if I can uh, uh, just plug a couple of books that I'm uh, I'm doing some reviews on right now. I'm working on. Um, hold on. This one right back here I got in, um, and I'm still going through it. It's, uh, it's from time. It's called The uh, New Frontiers of Space, and it looks like a coffee table book. Um, it's got a bunch of really great pictures in it, but it actually goes in depth into a lot of the um, into a lot of uh, space exploration missions, um, you know, past, present, and future, really focusing on who's important in the space industry right now, uh, what's coming up. Um, so it was, you know, I was uh, really pleasantly surprised that it wasn't, you know, wasn't just a bunch of, you know, Hubble photos and uh, uh, Spitzer photos. So yeah, uh, check that out. New Frontiers of Space. And Does I anyone just... remember that the Time Life Our Universe book? Oh, those were great. Yeah, I grew that... up on that one. I did too. I I, that is, I dog-eared. I destroyed that book. It is, you know, there couldn't be a, ha, there couldn't have been a more core influence on my life than that book. Well, you know, I see a, I see a book this big, okay, <laughs> and I'm thinking, all right, it's going to have all the, you know, the Ring Nebula and all this other stuff that I've seen before, and really what this, uh, what this new time book is about is about space exploration and where we're going. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, you know, really interesting stuff that's pertinent for the future uh, in this. And I also just finished Dave Goldberg's uh, book, The Universe in the Rearview Mirror, um, I wrote up a review on this on uh, lightsinthedark.com. This was a great time. Um, I'm not a physicist. I know nothing about physics. I barely passed math. Um, so his descriptions of how particle physics works um, and what symmetries are and all of this other stuff, I mean, I could pretty much understand it. I mean, you know, I, I, I like to say at the end, my head is still spinning, but at least now I know it spins to the left. So um, <laughs> That's awesome. he did a great job with that one. Anyway, check that out. Uh, have you read that, Matthew? I have not. I did. Well, you know, it just should. it just just came out uh, two weeks ago. So, um, okay. um, uh, oh, one thing: if you guys didn't realize, 
as as science journalists, all you have to do is ask any publisher for a copy of any book whatsoever, and they will send it to you. In fact, it becomes a terrible burden as the books pile up and you and you never get to them. I have so, a pile around my feet. Here. I know. I, I in fact, <laughs> I've I, got I, a few. Yeah. I, I've, I gave up, and now you know, for Universe Today, like we just we just spread the books far and wide to the to a large team of reviewers because. Like for me, like I'm a kid in a candy store. You sent, yeah, yeah, send me all the stuff. I will totally never get around to it and never get around to writing a review. Well, if, if, if I leave it to my, if I leave myself to my own devices, I won't read any books. I'll only read articles online and tweets and other yeah. stuff like that. Um, so actually having, pe having people send me a book to read about something I'm interested in is, you know, by giving me an assignment, I'll actually do it versus, you know, I'll just wander through a bookstore and go, oh, this might be interesting someday. Yeah. As if, if there were any bookstores that existed anymore, they're kind of yeah. like you know dinosaurs now. And and I'll just tell all of you watching as well is that if you want to review books, uh, let us know because we are always looking for more reviewers, and uh, we have lots of books, and we send we get them sent I'll right to you. I'll review books for you. <laughs> Great, just drop me an email. Um, but yeah, so we're always looking for more reviewers. And the deal is, you get to keep the book, but you got to write a review. And that's the that is the that is the arrangement. Um, uh, right. Okay. And Dr. Matthew Francis, where do we find out more? Uh, BowlerHatScience.org, Galileo's Pendulum.org. Uh, lots of stuff there. Um, you can find me at ArsTechnica.com, um, BBC Future. Uh, that seems to be the most popular places these days. Nautilus, the new. Science and Culture magazine, um, and uh, wanted to put in a plug for the next round of Cosmo Academy classes. So CosmoQuest.org slash classes. Um, you will find classes from uh, various people, including Pamela Gay and Emily Lakdawalla, who many of you know from Planetary, Sci Planetary Society work and also Space Hangout. But uh, big things coming, so Please sign up for our classes and learn about all sorts of cool stuff. Yeah, just to under, you know, I mean, we are giving people the opportunity to spend weeks on end with some of their favorite people in space and astronomy and learn directly from them for a very low price con yes. compared to, you know, what you might do to go and get your PhD. I mean, come on, Matthew, your PhD must have cost a fortune, and now we're giving the equivalent of it, you know, in eight short weeks. So... It's actually not even eight weeks. We're talking. We're talking two weeks to. You, you will get your hands on Mars rover images, and yeah. you will turn those into pretty pictures. So this is this is the kind of class we're offering you. That's terrific. Yeah, and I I'm I am amazed that people aren't you know just filling these up in a heartbeat. So we need to push this a little harder. So we get well, PhDs, so you don't have. To. <laughs> you don't have. There we PhDs. go. There we <laughs> exactly. Go. Um, cool. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone for joining us this week. It was great. And uh, next up is I guess going to be the virtual star party on Sunday night, where we hook up a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout and uh, and show you whatever's up there. So so thanks everyone for joining, and we will see you next time. And don't forget to wave at Saturn. Wave at yes. Saturn in yeah. one yeah. hour. Over yeah. an hour. Yep. 20 minutes, yeah. Okay. We'll be out in the rain. Cassini's Bye. watching. Bye, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye, Saturn.